welcome to LA Today. I'm Walt Mason. With me today is our own Ken from Residence, Sam Page. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Now, I've done over 17 episodes of this podcast. It's a little bit backward today, which is okay. <laughs> uh, Sam's having a couple technical difficulties. He'll be uh, logging in as soon as he can get them ironed out. But uh, we do have a guest joining us today, and uh, he was telling me before the show, he doesn't know why he's here. And, and I understand that. <laughs> I, I, I get that reaction because um, he knows that we talk about law of attraction here. Tom, I can assure you, it's not like the conversational topic. It's not, okay. We spend maybe like this much time on it. Um, because after the first 300 episodes, what else are you going to say, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I get that. You know, there's a lot of skepticism about the whole topic. So I, I can understand why you'd be a little bit concerned, like, wow, is this really a good place for me? But I, I assure you, it, it really is a good place for you to be. It's really a good place for anybody to be because the way we look at it is this. Um, and I don't, I don't even know how much you even know about the topic. I know you, you alluded to it a bit in a conversation we had offline. But the way I like to explain it in a way that's kind of uh, – accessible for everybody is that it's exactly the same concept as what Christians call sowing and reaping. And if you can understand that concept, you understand law of attraction. So really that's, that's the whole conversational point right there. But uh, I'll be, I'll be interested to find out more about what your reservations are as we get to know you. But first let's get to know you a little bit because you have really a fascinating background. You're, you're, you're one of those internet millionaires that we heard about for the last 20, 30 years. And you, you made an interesting little comment in the profile that I saw about you. you never worked in a job. There are people who are going to be listening and saying, oh, that sounds so <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I actually applied for a job once, Walt. It, it said it had a 401K, and I thought, man, that's a good starting salary. Yeah, you know, right. I, <laughs> I didn't get that job. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so it's um, – I've always found a way. You know, they say an entrepreneur will work 18 hours a day to get out of working eight hours a day. For right, right. Else. I know that one very yeah. well, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've just lived my whole life that way. My dad came from uh, Syria on a cattle boat in the early 1900s. Oh, wow. uh, this, uh, if you remind me later, I'll tell you about this little poster behind me. Okay. Um, but, uh, and he became an entrepreneur. He put the first electric light bulb in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. Really? And had his own electrical contracting firm at 13 years old. Wow. It was all battery, battery operated. Right, you know, he, right. He hook up batteries to lights. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, uh, so he became an entrepreneur, turned me into an entrepreneur, and I've helped thousands of entrepreneurs. Uh, That's and they're exciting. actually doing a documentary about, uh, called The American Entrepreneur based on, this whole scenario of my dad coming and becoming an entrepreneur and then me helping lots of people. So, uh, that so must really, be fun, by the way, just to well, have a documentary done about what you, you and your, well, your family well, done. I tell you, when they came to me about it, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I thought you were supposed to be dead before they do a documentary. <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> didn't they pass a minute. law? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, man, are they trying to tell me something that I'm on my way out? <laughs> Uh, but, <laughs> That's where yeah. you whip out the Mark Twain quote, right? You know, the, the, the uh, reports right. of my demise are greatly exaggerated. Greatly exaggerated yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I just uh, always have found a way to make uh, make my own way. I've had a lot of uh, fun businesses. I've had some dangerous businesses. I I, uh, I had a nightclub for six years uh, where uh, bikers were trying to kill me uh, every day for uh, six straight years. Oh, and, and then, we got fun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whenever, I, you know, here's what happened, Walt. And so I I decided in my youth, you know, this was, I was in my 20s. I decided to buy this biker bar and turn it into a nice family restaurant and nightclub. A real nice oh, club. I see. <laughs> and so, you know, call me crazy, but these bikers just uh, somehow did not appreciate my efforts. <laughs> and, and so I was in two guns by... Yeah, uh, I was in two gunfights, knife fights, uh, over a hundred violent encounters, and um, and this was in Morgantown, West Virginia. I went to college on a football scholarship to West by God, Virginia. We have to say by God, ah, yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then I bought this uh, this nightclub. But I mean, there was one sheriff and one state police for three hundred square miles. Wow! So it was every man for himself. I had right. I carried a gun. All the time, and the two gunfights that we had, the sheriff came out the next day 
<laughs> and he said, hey, Tom, I heard you had some excitement out here. He says, anybody get hurt? I said, well, I, you know, they didn't hit me. I, I don't, I haven't seen them. <laughs> and he thought about it for a second. He says, okay, be careful. That was a whole investigation. He Jeez. left. <laughs> yeah, this is West Virginia. Yeah. So, Talk about uh, the Wild West. Ooh. Yeah. So, uh, so I did that for six years and then I got, uh, uh, the drinking age. Uh, I was on my way to being a millionaire before I turned 30 in this business. And, uh, then the drinking age went from 18 to 21. It was a college town and oh, wiped yes. me out. I lost 400,000 bucks and lost wow. everything. And, but the, but the thing is, and the kind of the lesson I like to, to tell about this is that, you know, I grew up in a small town, 500 people in our little town, Claysville, Pennsylvania. Mm. Named after the great statesman Henry, Henry Clay. Clay. Sure. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, I, I don't think he slept there. His horse took a dump there on the way through, <laughs> oh, and that geez. was good enough for us. <laughs> so, what so, are we going to call our little burger? Oh, let's call it Claysville. Yeah, Why not? Claysville. Yeah. Why not? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you did what you said you were going to do. You a, sh- a, sh- a handshake meant something. Uh, it was a village, uh, so if you did something wrong, the neighbor could slap you up about it and not get sued, you know, that kind of neighborhood. <laughs> All right, so, so, um, when I, uh, I went out of business, I'm hearing my dad, uh, in my head saying, you don't screw people over, you know, cause I could have gone bankrupt. I said, you know what? I'm young. I'm tough. I'm not going bankrupt. I went immediately to all the creditors and I said, look, you know me, this wasn't anything, I wasn't some drunk and drinking up all the profits and some idiot. I just got put out of business because of one legislative pan stroke. And I said, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm good for this. I won't go bankrupt if you just give me time to pay you off. And, of course, they didn't have much choice because I could have gone bankrupt, but they all agreed. And so over time, I paid them all off. And I could go back to that town today and they'd say, that's the guy that did not screw us. Mm-hmm. And so that's the kind of reputation you want to, uh, you know, put forth. So I agree. So yeah. it's just, there's just a little sliver of the colorful life I've, <laughs> I've been living. You know, there's actually a takeaway, I think, from what you just told. The, the takeaway is, and this is a theme I have encountered over and over again, interviewing people who've been very, very financially successful. And that is financially successful people. They aren't fearless, but they often behave fearless. And, mm. and you behave fearless. I mean, your story very clearly illustrates that. Well, yeah. I mean, um, uh, the thing is, is uh, you know, I was fortunate. I had, uh, even though my dad only went to the second grade, all right, he was the smartest guy I ever knew. He sat down. I don't know, a lot of young people never even know what I'm talking about here, but I, I witnessed him sit down when he retired and read the entire World Book Encyclopedia, Whoa. 26 volumes oh. plus supplements. Wow. Uh, and I like it's on DVD now, or it doesn't even, I'm not even on a DVD <laughs> now, people have ever heard. What is that? 26 volumes of what? You know, it's a thing this wide. Uh, and, uh, and he was just, uh, brilliant, but he, um, you know, he, he put good, I hear some, some child's being murdered somewhere, is it? <laughs> it? It sounds like it. And, and there's a whole story I could tell alongside that, but I'll, I'll hold that one. For you know, time. I can't but, hear yeah. Sam when he says, is, is your audio working there, Sam? What? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, keep saying, <laughs> I, I thought you were saying stuff and I couldn't hear anything. Oh, so. I was chiming in, but I think it was also when other people were talking. So, oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so he was brilliant, and he, he put good, you know, stock into me as a young person, and that's uh, that's one another thing that uh, a lot of the young people that hear me on these episodes are are that you don't have to uh, in today's atmosphere, you don't have to. The bar is pretty low. You can stand out from the crowd, uh, the, the young folks like Sam's young guy, uh, to uh, to really stand out and impress us old geezers that can make and break you, you know? So, uh, so uh, for instance, the first kid that I started, I, I, I call them techno geeks. You know, I'm in the internet business now. <laughs> so I, I say, uh, you know, propeller heads and techno geeks. The first kid that I recruited out of 10th grade just sold Pluto dot TV. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's kind of like a Hulu Netflix kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Ooh. 
$340 million he sold Oof. for it. And he wrote an article in Forbes how I started him in business. And he would have yeah. just been a corporate slug if it hadn't been for me. So so I'm, I'm really uh, interested in helping uh, young people. Uh, but, you know, I want them to be on time. I wanted some old school attitudes in them. You know, I was, I was interviewing on my podcast um, a millennial expert or something. I said, you know, uh, and I believe in being on time. If you're not early, you're late. And and she said, well, you know, in our generation, you know, time is flexible. And I'm thinking, all right, so so I have a store that says, okay, we open at 9. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe 9.30. <laughs> you know, just, well, that, that could work in California. Let's be yeah, honest. I guess it could, you know. But, so I'm, I'm saying, hey, if you could just be on time and do what you say you're going to do. You're going to raise above lots of your competitors in the, in the business world. I think there's truth to that for sure. And, uh, as somebody who grew up in the, in the old school, I can appreciate a lot. I've also got the other side of it because, um, I, as my listeners know, I, I run my wife's gardening business. My wife is pretty much retired from it, but I keep it going. So it keeps generating income and such. And I basically let our gardeners show up to do the job on the schedule that works for them. As long as they get their hours in that day, that's, mm-hmm. that's fine with me. But I can also see the flip side of that because it, it does make it a challenge for me and for my <laughs> VA and others to get the scheduling right and, to, and mm-hmm. to interact with the customers in a way that they can expect. You know, you, you learn how to talk to the customer so that they can appreciate that the gardener is going to get the job done, but I can't promise exactly what time he's going to show up. <laughs> You know, and, 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 you know, they, if they do a good enough job, they can accept that. But certainly if we were in startup mode, oh, in man, startup man. mode, I, I wouldn't settle for that for anything because yeah. you don't have a reputation yet. And the, the customers don't know what to expect about you. They haven't heard your name. They don't know anything about you. You know, so how, how else can you get them other than by leaving a good impression? And I, and I have a, uh, a lot of people ask me about my, uh, uh let's say somewhat, uh, unique and colorful way to hire people uh, that you, <laughs> you couldn't get away with probably anywhere except craigslist mm, and that's where okay, i get all my those, yeah. that's where i get all my employees from craigslist and i write these really rotten mean ads really and yeah i'll tell you i'll tell you how that, it works. that's that's definitely not old school that's new school well here's the thing uh it can no it can be old school when you hear me out on this so first okay. of all uh, in my internet business that I've been running since 1994 when the commercial internet started, you know, I'm old. I, you know, I'm so far over the hill, I can't remember going up the hill. <laughs> so I want young people that, you know, that are good tech savvy people. So I don't want a 55 year old MBA who can't even turn his computer on to apply for a job. Uh, so, so the, the first key is the title of the ad says paid internship. Ah. Well, no person, you know, much older person with an MBA is going to apply for an internship. So that really. gets rid of them <laughs> right off the bat. Then I give them all the good stuff. Okay, you're going to work for this uh, multimillionaire Internet guy that will teach you all this great stuff and get them sucked in. Mm-hmm. Then then I get to the part where I said, but if you are, don't take pride in your work and show up on time and be reliable – then if I don't throw you out of here in five minutes, the other good people that work here will. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. And so I scare off all the idiots and people that are the people I wouldn't want in a million years, and only the good people that say, well, I'll show him. I'm a good worker. I'm, you know, and then some of them been here 10, 12 years. No, I, wait, <laughs> so, no, hold on a second. I, I don't see, Sam, do you see that as mean? I don't, I don't hear a mean word in there. Not well, I, the language is, I said, if you're a worthless <laughs> slug, you know, oh, <laughs> that, right. that could be a little me. In the ad, so maybe we can withhold judgment. But, you know, it's a, I think it's an effective method to weed out less less desirable candidates. So, I but, think it, but is it mean, though? I'm yeah. kind of doing them and me a favor, <laughs> I guess, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean I've had so I, many I guess stories. one person's mean is another person's self-defense. It depends on how you look at it. Yeah. I mean, I don't try to be mean to anybody, but uh, but sometimes you have to you, know, you have to be uh, truthful. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, truthful. I, I don't think that that truthful is inherently mean or good or whatever. 
the attitude behind the person expressing the truth, that could be mean. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, but what about when uh, Aunt Nellie's hat looks like, you know, uh, your uh, gardener on, uh, that messed up and forgot to water the plants? And you say, how, and she says, how do you like my hat? Oh, it's beautiful, Aunt Nellie. Well, that's, that's not truthful, <laughs> but it's nice. But yeah. I said, it looks like hell. You should go hide somewhere. Well, that would be kind of mean to Aunt Nellie. <laughs> but again, I would say that's because of the attitude of the person saying it. You could also say it in another way. You could say something like, well, it's not exactly my cup of tea. It's the same meaning. It's just mm-hmm. said in a more kind way. Okay. Know, so just, it it, it depends on the person, really. I mean, <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is, this is actually a law of attraction concept. Um, the reason I say that is the way oh, we no. think here about we things. Go. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> well, I can't promise that you'll never have to be exposed to it here on the show. So disclaimer, you know, warning, here comes a spoiler alert, right? We're going to talk a little LOA for a moment. Um, but <laughs> Sam's in a dead faint. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but the simple fact is what we're talking about when we talk about attracting stuff into our lives is what our attitude is and how we express ourselves and how our expression is a reflection of what we think about. And I'll, I'll equate that to what your life story, as I understand it so far, involves. You went into life, first of all, you had great background because your father would, would provide a tremendous influence for you. But you also, th- you, you thrived with that background. You took that background, you incorporated it into yourself, and you applied yourself toward developing your first business. I'm not even sure what your first business was. It doesn't really matter at this the, point. That's the rub right there. I applied myself. Yes. That's what my complaint is about the stupid secret and all that crap. Uh, and here we go. <laughs> all right, well, let's go for it. Yeah. So, you... so, so tell me what's, what's crap about the secret. That'll well, be great. first of all, I'm, I have to note that the moment you start talking about the secrets, your audio started to glitch. So I don't know. (laughs) This is not unusual. This is not unusual. (laughs) We we, technical difficulties happen right till that moment. Energies go crazy. (laughs) This is, this is normal. So I know where's the, you know, the vortexes from, you know, the owner starting to come after. See, he knows lingo. (laughs) (laughs) So, so here's the thing. Uh, Well, let me, I'll preface this with a more modern uh, thing. Sure. If I uh, drive down the street and mm-hmm. there's a bunch of young people out there mm-hmm. holding their football helmets out or something and and begging for donations for their football uniforms, right? Okay. You could hold a gun to my head and I wouldn't give them a nickel because what am I teaching them to do? Beg. Okay. Now, if they were doing a car wash. I'll have my car washed 10 times in a row because I'm okay. teaching them you give value for for your enumeration, right? Okay. So when I see a kid sitting on a couch ba- uh, thinking, dreaming about a bicycle and a bicycle shows up, that's the most BS I've ever seen in my whole life. And that's what the <laughs> whole secret was about. And half the people in it are, are – uh, well, see, I, I have a – TV show in Hollywood on development called Scam Brigade. And I've been around so long, I know where all the skeletons are. Okay. So half the people uh, in that movie, I wouldn't put a $10 bill in front of me because it would, if I looked away, it'd be gone. All right. So I know these people. So, um, but the whole, the whole thing is apply yourself, you know, and I am not naive. And I am not arrogant to think that we're the only force in the world. And I love visualization. I think that's the mindset that really is powerful. But to sit, you, you have, if you don't, if you, if you just sit on that couch and dream about bicycles, but let me put it, put it in Sam's terms. I'll bet you if you just dreamed about playing, a, being able to play the piano, uh, you would suck at the piano. I could. <laughs> You practice your butt off for, I don't know how, how good you are, how long you've done it, but probably for years to get where you're at because you applied yourself. So that's my complaint is saying that just thinking about something is going to make it happen. No, you got to get your fat butt up and do something. And then those two working together, extremely powerful. I agree. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. We got there, there, there's only one thing that I would take slight issue with. Okay. And it, it's something that I made the same mistake on too, because I made the, I drew the same conclusions about the movie The Secret that you did, until I went back and rewatched it. 
And then what I found was it wasn't the whole movie. It was one scene, the kid with the wagon, who basically – not a wagon, with a bicycle. Who, bicycle, who, who, yeah. who, who basically his grandfather bought him the bicycle as a gift, which is – that's the scene that you're taking issue with. But if you look at the other scenes, in every one of those other scenes, they took action. All right. Well – I'm not going to go back and watch it. I'll take your word. Because yeah. <laughs> you're right about that scene. That is exactly what happened in that. Well, scene. that's yeah, but that was a very you know famous scene that a lot of mm -hmm. people like me you know took. It and a lot out, of people have you know? complained about the yeah. movie for that reason that it, mm -hmm. that it didn't. And I agree. I think it could have emphasized the action piece a lot more. I think it would have been helpful if it. Had, uh, I think I would have learned the concepts more easily if they had emphasized the action piece. I was kind of confused about the movie the first few times um, that I saw it and that I, I tried to absorb it. Um, but I also recognized there was a lot of value in what they were talking about. Well, and now, I'm, I'm totally in favor of, uh, well, there's, you know, I became a believer in two things because of two specific incidents that uh, happened to me. One is visualization. And so when I had the nightclub, we were near a lake, uh, a resort lake, and these big shot executives would come down from uh, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and then they'd come to my nightclub, and then, uh, you know, being the owner, everybody wants to take you out on their boat and this, this and that, and so they want me to go skiing. Now, I can't even swim, and so <laughs> they want me to go skiing. And so I said, you know, they just begged me all summer. So I said, okay, I'll go, but I'm wearing two life jackets in case one malfunction. <laughs> and that's, I did. I had a, a extra large and a double XL over. I'm like a buoy out there in the lake. <laughs> all right. And, and so all summer they're trying to pull me up with this boat, and I'm getting nothing but fish enemas because I'm they're pulling me and I can't get up and I'm crashing and the only difference between water and cement is water is wet you know so I'm like bruised up I'm uh so at the end of the summer um I actually got up on the skis and went a mile down the lake People on the side of the lake are holding up like Olympic things, yeah, and like <laughs> screaming, you know, because they saw this big whale out there the whole time, crashing in the water, splashing and the everything. And so, so that was the last day of the season. And so I went and worked at the bar the rest of the year, but I was thinking about it, what it felt like. I was visualizing and feeling mm -hmm. that muscle memory of what it felt like all winter didn't sure. was nowhere near the lake nothing so they next year they come back down they say come on tom we got to go back to the lake okay i'll give it another shot first try got up and went five miles down the lake nice what's the reason for that it had a, it's a mental thing yeah. that that made that happen you know yeah, so you essentially programmed your your belief system and your body said okay i believe it let's do it Another thing that happened to me, I'm considered a martial arts, uh, not a martial arts, but a self-defense expert because okay. my lifetime of study in the arts and my uh, six years of hundreds of violent encounters and winning all of them because I'm still here talking. Um, so uh, one of my instructors was a real tall, skinny guy, looks like Jesus, and he was a kung fu uh, grandmaster. I should tell, I should give you a little, uh, heads up here. Both, Tom, uh, Sam and I are very, very tall and thin. So just, just kind of like a little, but warm. neither one is like Jesus. This guy, no, had no, long yeah. hair. <laughs> no, no long beard, no long hair. No, but, but <laughs> so, just, just saying, just giving you a little heads up. You know. So he's, uh, he's working with me and, um, and there's a concept, uh, called chi and mm -hmm. it's an internal power. So like if mm -hmm. I just hit you, and, and I knock you backwards. Okay. That's just a normal punch and power and you go flying. Mm -hmm. But if I hit you and you just drop that power went inside you and dropped you straight away. That's you, you know, the cheat. And it takes a lot uh, to ever get control of that. And mm -hmm. be honest with you, I was a non-believer. I'm like, eh, it's one of these stupid, you know, Asian martial arts movies. That's, you know, the, the sound doesn't line up. I, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, um, so this guy, um, was about, uh, less than an inch away from me with an open hand and he just went like this 
and hit my chest, I thought an atomic bomb went off inside me. It went, I didn't move. It went inside, went up into my brain. I had a headache for two, three weeks wow. after that. Wow. That's when I became a believer of that, when something actually happened that showed, ooh, wow, this guy. And then, of course, he's apologetic because he was just learning to control it, but oh. it didn't happen to at that time. So right, right. Your, your teachers, it's embarrassment to them to hurt their students. But but so uh, he, he did. I, I actually had a, a story where um, I realized after the fact that I had experienced that power of chi mm -hmm. without realizing what I was doing. Um, there was a time when I played golf fairly frequently. And I, I was out playing solo one day. There was nobody out in the course. I was pretty much the only one out there. And I came to this one hole. It was, about, it was a par four, a little bit long for a par four. And it had been marked out with a driving range. They'd obviously had a driving contest on this hole. I thought, oh, well, this is kind of fun. Well, well, I, see. I, I had no idea how far I could hit a ball. And, and this, <laughs> okay. this was before metal clubs. This was with wooden drivers. So this oh, was like right. years ago, right? And it was marked out, I think... I think it was actually not all that long a par four. I think it was only like 330, 340, something like that. Um, but it was all marked. I said, okay, well, hey, this is great. So I, I mean, I really took a lot of time, right? And I was going through mentally, I, I wasn't a great golfer by any stretch of the imagination, but I was tall, so I could hit a ball fairly well. But I figured, okay, I'm going to just put, pour everything I can into this. I'm just going to, I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be everything that I could possibly be using every piece of information I've ever put together. And I took a long time preparing for that swing. I visualized, I did all that stuff. And then I got into position and I was like, I was even hearing my grandfather's voice. My grandfather had tried to teach me golf, not terribly successfully. He was a good teacher, just now I wasn't a very good student. But nevertheless, I heard his voice. He was telling me all these things. And I'm so I'm mm -hmm. doing all these things. I'm barely I'm holding onto the club barely enough that I can just, you know, not, not let it go flying. That's, that's the way he was trying to, to teach it to me. I took the swing back. I followed through. And as I'm coming through the ball, I could, it was almost like, like my grandfather had grabbed the club and was pulling it out of my hands. And, I, and, and it was it was intense, and, and it was also one of those moments like if you're in a car crash or something, like everything goes slow motion for a moment. It was that kind of slow motion experience. And I hit the ball, and as soon as I hit it, I, it was like I felt a surge of energy coming through my arms, through my body, through the club, into the ball, and I knew that ball was going to fly. And I looked up. It was the farthest ball I'd ever hit in my life. The, the ball flight took a long – I mean – Again, I was experiencing it like it was all slow motion, so I'm not sure exactly how long it took. I would guess the flight of the ball probably took about 25 seconds. It was a long, long flight. And when it came down, I hit over 300 yards with a wooden driver. And I thought, damn, I've never come close <laughs> to that before. <laughs> and only after the fact, I realized that was probably chi energy that was feeling through my arms into the club. That was producing that effect. I, I was probably passing energy that way in a way that I never succeeded in doing before or since, actually. I've never been able to pull it off after that. And, and you're sure it wasn't the beer girls giving you too much beer in the, in the cart, right? I, I'm very I'm very sure because I don't drink beer and there were no beer girls. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I was ter a terrible golfer. I played in, in high school a little bit, but I remember one time the, um, uh, the grounds – keeper was i uh, was on the uh, women uh woman's tee and the groundskeeper was yelling at me like you know you big dummy you know, you're on the wrong <laughs> tee i said it's my second shot shut up <laughs> <laughs> the tea is incidental right <laughs> yeah. trying to give myself a better lie yeah <laughs> so oh man so uh i had one other well, uh, okay, I'll, uh, this is, seems like a good out, outlet for one other bone for me to pick. <laughs> okay, go for it. I live in Virginia Beach, all right? Mm -hmm. The, um, oh, what's it, the uh, somebody center down at Virginia Beach, the, oh, what's the guy's name? The, he used to be a dentist, and he was a psychic uh, guy, I forget. Uh, oh, but, I know who you mean, um, Ed, 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 um, Casey. Casey, yeah. yes. Yeah, so they got this big center down here yeah, yes. and everything, but... Uh, so my complaint is, is that you can go down to the beach and take a two-day course and become a Reiki master, all right? Mm -hmm. The word master and two days of training does not <laughs> sit well with me. I get it. Yes. That is yeah. 
this this is can't be it can't be real. I mean, it's a fraudulent thing to call somebody a master who hasn't studied and been the top of their game for years and years and stuff. So I started teasing him. I said, "Okay, you're so good. How about giving me a Reiki haircut or something? How about a you know just look, go like this and my hair will get shorter? Reiki car wash? <laughs> you know, don't touch touch anything. So so yeah, I." I run into that and I dated a girl one time who was bragging to me. I dated her one time because, oh my God, she <laughs> had uh, put an ad in a magazine that said that she had um, found um, these pipes from the ancient Indians or something with, and, and she sold and she just, she was trying to cheat people basically. And she, she uh, ended up selling 50,000 of them. Wow. And her and her daughter had to go buy him from China and glue hot glue oh, feathers on him and stuff, and nobody returned him. Mm. So it seems to me there's a, some a lot of naive people in, the, in the, that you know are easily duped. Uh, wonderfully nice people. That's what. That's why I started the anti scam thing because some of the nicest people on earth are too trusting, and the bad people will take advantage of you. And so mm. I'm very much against that and so that's why i started the show okay that's fair enough i can understand that um for for, for my own uh perspective i'm not terribly interested in how long somebody studied something in terms of whether or not they're a master because the first time that i experienced anything reiki related i i could feel something that i didn't think was possible i was able to feel energy it was all from my wife's body. I was I was helping my body, my 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 wife rather, because she had a uh, headache, and and we were trying to use this technique that a Reiki person had taught us, and my God, it worked. So, does that mean I have mastered Reiki? Well, maybe not, but I mastered something I didn't think I could do. I was actually able to summon energy, use it to, to help my wife heal. I still don't even know how I did it, but just the fact that I was able to do it at all that requires some degree of mastery that I didn't even know I had. So yeah, I guess I guess it depends on how you define the term master. If you can't replicate it though, and you hold yourself but I can't, out but I, but and I can charge money it. to other people, and I'm not charging for it, but yeah. I, I, can, I can replicate, and I've replicated mm-hmm. it many times. Uh, well, you know, so I mastered you, doing something that I didn't think I could do. Right? Maybe that's one thing out of all the repertoire of Reiki. And I don't call know, myself a Reiki tech, master because I haven't techniques. studied the rest of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, but you know. Doing one, and, and we see that a lot in the internet marketing world. Is somebody oh, sure. sold one thing, actually, and and actually the way they they trick you is they say we sold two hundred thousand uh, dollars worth of this in two weeks, and you have to buy this thing. And so that may be true that they sold two hundred thousand dollars worth, but they didn't tell you they spent a hundred thousand dollars in affiliate commissions. Mm-hmm. They spent. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars in ads, and they actually lost fifty thousand dollars out of that two hundred <laughs> yeah. to make it up on you because you know they're going to sucker you into buying it. You know, so and it's quite possible. Yeah, there's, so. there, there, there's an interesting uh, corollary that goes along with all this, though, and I think it does again have a law of attraction angle to it. Uh, but if you don't want to look at, look at it from law of attraction, let's look at it from the point of view of of, of neuroscience and neuroplasticity, which is that the more that you give your attention to something. First of all, the more you program your brain to notice that same kind of thing. Second of all, the more you program yourself to be exposed to a set of circumstances that you have already decided you're going to react a certain way to because you either approve of it or disapprove of it. And so what you've done is you've managed to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's that's essentially what a self-fulfilling prophecy is. You, you basically have programmed yourself to accept something as always being a certain way, and you keep looking for it, and you keep finding it, and so therefore it's always a certain way. And I bring that up because you seem to be drawing a conclusion that because there are, for instance, Internet scam artists and people who make false claims about Reiki and all that kind of thing, that therefore that's invalidation of the theory of law of attraction. And that strikes me as a fallacy. Well, I'm not even uh, comparing those two things. I was just saying that that's um, uh, calling something, uh, calling yourself a master to me is fraudulent. Because the word master has the connotation to the, um, to the general public. If you ask anybody, if you mm-hmm. took the first thousand people down the street, define the word master. Not, it's nobody 
that's got half the a brain half their or an IQ half their shoe size is going to say <laughs> a two day course in Virginia Beach makes you a master. <laughs> right? That's what I'm saying. Right. Well, no, some people will. I, I don't worry about it one way or another, but obviously it concerns you. Well, I mean, I just don't want to see people being robbed. And do you know 120? Well, I have a, I have a question for you about that. Yeah. And this, I, I have to admit, we're starting to get into the advanced area of what we talk about here on the show. But if one person takes advantage of another person in some way, that's what a robbery is, right? One person taking advantage of another mm-hmm. person. There are two people involved. Certainly, the person who's doing the taking advantage, there's a clear-cut thing there. Okay, this person's taking advantage. They're, they're, they're crossing a line that our society doesn't accept for good reason. You know, there, there's something going on there. But the question I have for you is, is there what we often call here on the show a victimhood psychology that attracts people to being victimized by a fraud artist? I'd say, yes, there is, but... When I uh, describe a, um, a scenario for you that's very common, do you know that uh, uh, scammers are uh, using Google Earth to uh, target older people and scaring them into either paying up for their scam or they might see on Google Earth, you're the one with the red door, right? If you don't pay yeah, up, we're coming me. after you. It wouldn't surprise What's me. It? it would not surprise me. Yeah. See, so is that older person, uh, you know, showing some victimhood? No, they are a victim of scams. Well, it depends. Yeah. It depends well, on whether or not they fall for the scam. If well, they didn't fall for the scam, are they a victim? Well, they're a victim if, uh, they're a victim whether they paid out any money or not because they were terrorized by being well, scared. Well, I'm not so sure about that either because the word terrorize implies an emotional context. Yeah, and, 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 if, and one of the things that we talk about a lot here is we get to choose how we're going to respond emotionally in any given situation. So the fact is that one person can experience situation X as being terrorized, and a second person could experience the exact same X and not feel terrorized because they choose to feel differently about it. Well, that might be true for me because if you pull that crap on me, you know, if I'm <laughs> nice to you, they're only going to take you out on a stretcher, okay? But an older person uh, that's that doesn't have the ability to protect themselves and they can't and they don't know if it's real or not uh, is is being victimized you know it's not their fault at all they were uh, they were chosen because they're weaker uh, and and more susceptible to this so I can't put any blame on the hundred and twenty thousand people that uh, elder people that lost their homes last year. From the uh, from no, no, the, no, wait, wait, wait. We got, we, got subtract, we got to subtract out a concept here. When we describe someone as being a victim, that is not a judgment. It is not a blame. Blame is not part of it. This is a description of were they victimized or not. In other words, were they, were they taken advantage of or not? That's what we're, I think we have to define the term here. What are we calling a victim? I would say uh, they were uh, a victim uh, because of that mental game that was played on them that that scared the, the hell out of them. I mean, I mean, just imagine your mother, you know, Sam's mother or grandparents or something, and somebody did that to them. Um, would you say, oh, you shouldn't have worried about it? Yeah, it's no big deal. No, you'd probably be furious about it and uh, of what happened to them. I suspect you would if you, you know, that's, again, you, you uh, made reference to societal norms. I mean, uh, is it okay or should we really pick apart the fact that this elderly person had this done to them and and use semantics to say, well, you know. I'm not so sure it's semantics, though. I don't <laughs> think it's semantics. I, th- I think you're actually taking it too far when you describe it as semantics. Because l- let me let me expound on this for just a moment to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. When we say that it's semantic, what we're really saying is that the words don't matter and that all we're really doing is to kind of take it to an extreme point of view, we're denying a reality and burying our heads in the sand about this terrible situation. That's really what we're driving at here, right? But the fact is, it's only a terrible situation if we decide that it's a terrible situation. What if you don't That's have the, the capacity to decide? I like, don't know anyone or, who does like, oh, I'll give you a perfect example. A guy got arrested that owned a grocery store 
And everybody thought he's so wonderful because he was giving uh, uh, people, uh, special ed type people, uh, less mental capacity people, jobs. He was sexually abusing them in the back room. I agree. That's not a good situation. It's an unhappy <laughs> situation. Not, but not, here's, the, here's the question. Understatement of the Here, world. Here's the question. Here's the question. What you're, just, what you're describing is a scenario where somebody was taking advantage of them, deceiving them in, into a, a behavior that they would not, that, that most people would not want to be involved in. They certainly would not want to see these people involved in. But the question I have in my mind is, you, you said that, there, that certain people are incapable. And, and I asked myself, if somebody is experiencing a, a kind of mental ha- handicap, that's what we're describing this mm-hmm. scenario, does that mean that they're incapable? And the answer, no, wait, 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 wait. A handicap. well, let, hang on a it's second. It's not there a golf are, handicap. It's like there, you there are a lot that... of people, though, bear with me for a second. There are a lot of people who fall into what used to be called, they won't even call it any, that anymore because they figure they're, they're, there's a, an unfair aspersion and they're, they don't want to have to deal with. They're being described as being handicapped in some way who would say, I don't think of myself that way. In fact, that that's actually becoming more and more of a topic these days. People who fall into certain categories that we previously described as being handicapped or special needs or whatever, and they, the people themselves don't think of them that way. Is it true for all of them? No. But some of them, it's definitely true. They don't think of themselves that way. So I'll once go, again, this I'll is totally the danger, this, this is the danger that's involved in broad brushing. And I think that's really what we're doing here. We're broad brushing. We're saying, here's a scenario, broad brush it. Now we got a whole class of victims. And I don't think you can justifiably do that. Oh yeah. I can justify in my own mind. Well, in your own mind, you can. <laughs> but if we're talking about in terms of a conversation, I don't think conversationally we can really do that. Well, like I said, if you took uh, all the groups of people that that young lady was in, or I mean, uh, uh, everybody similar to her with mental capacity, you can broad brush the fact that this guy took advantage of that person that was totally innocent, totally innocent. And so everybody like her, I can say, put them all in one category if that happened to them that is wrong and they are victims they are they didn't have any choice or say in the matter uh, because they didn't have the ability to have it when you say they didn't have the ability so that means they can't ever learn yeah they can learn but it, but in that, that situation well that's down the road yeah if it happened to them twice that's different but the first time uh, well, no, they didn't have the, any... the first the first time I got bullied or I got beaten or I got whatever, yeah, it was a surprise to me too. Did you learn? Yeah. Well, all right. Well, then <laughs> you were a victim the first time, but you learned and you. I learned how not to be a victim anymore, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about capability. When I talk about capability, I don't think of it as a static one incident situation. I think of it as a growing human being over the course of a lifetime. I know, but that one incident can can affect the rest of the person's life. Sure it can, yeah. But here's the, here's the other part of it. How long are we going to focus on that one incident? Well, who, uh, <laughs> Seriously, how, I mean, we, have, we have an entire lifetime. How long are we going to spend on that one particular incident in the lifetime? It's up to them, really, and the, the, how much focus they put into it just kind of determines their journey going forward. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's an interesting theory. But, well, I think it's more than a theory. I think it's fact. I'm saying, a lot of people, a lot of people who've had a lot of experience following that kind of path. Well, what I'm saying is, is uh, somebody chops your arm off, and maybe you um, make a great life for yourself. But if you don't notice that you have a missing arm <laughs> the rest of your life, then you're blind too. Yeah. So, yeah, now I think we're definitely in the well, world of the absurd. Okay, you don't have somebody chopped your arm off and you didn't notice. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. No, I'm saying together. that uh, you said how long should you think about it for the, you know, uh, and it's right there in front of you for the rest of your life. So some things do change your life permanently. You wouldn't agree with that? Yeah, of course they do. But well, I, that's I'm not what sure, I'm but I'm not, but I'm not sure that the word permanent is in there. Do they change their life? Yeah. The question is, what is permanent? Even a hair permanent isn't even permanent. The, what we're talking about here is how, what perspective are we bringing to the table? What perspective are we bringing at any given moment? And what perspective are we changing to as we go through our lives? 
right now you're de- you're defining everything in terms of one catastrophic or traumatic event that happens in a person's life, and you're defining their lives based on that traumatic event. And by the way, that's precisely how people get hooked up in the idea that that traumatic event is controlling their lives because they keep revisiting the event over and over and over again in their minds. Whereas well, the people, whereas the people who move forward, who get past it, who grow past it, who actually get stronger because of it, do so because they grew past it and grew stronger. I so agree how with so again I come back that. to you how so again I come back to you, how much time and effort are we going to give focusing on the traumatic event and how much time are we going to give to moving past it? I think you should attempt to move past it just as you described, but you're never going to forget about. It. That's what I'm saying. Okay, it, it it may have changed the course of your life. Sure, and that and that could be permanent. Until you die. Permanent? Uh, permanent, I have trouble with. Well, I, as you, I don't know if you believe life after death and all that stuff, but, I mean, uh, it, permanent in in just regular terms is okay till you're dead. All right, so. Uh, if Again, you, if I point to hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> they call them permanents. <laughs> they should be permanent for 400 bucks that I gave my girlfriend to get one <laughs> up in D.C. That's for sure. <laughs> The one thing that is constant in all of the universe is change. Change That's, is constant. I, I agree with that and taxes too. <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny. <laughs> it all go, does go to show just how valuable perspective is though, because what we're really doing is we're coming at this with two very different perspectives and, and I have respect for, for your perspective. Certainly it's a, it's a valid perspective. It's one that's shared by a lot of people. Um, I hope, I don't know if you do or not, I hope you have res- pre- uh, respect for my perspective. Well, yeah, see, I'm not the current uh, standard in the world of, if somebody doesn't agree with you, they're evil. That's the, uh, that <laughs> yeah. appears to be the current standard. Yeah, uh, well, it doesn't get you anywhere. That yeah, just, that ruins no, your life. it doesn't, but that's, it's, it's more and more prevalent. Uh, and yeah, the, the debate has gone in the world, uh, mostly, and uh, like I said, this, like I said, this is, this is going better than I expected. Put it that way. <laughs> well, good, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, you can go back and forth. That's uh, that's what they used to have in college debates. And now, now, uh, no. If you don't believe with me, we're gonna cancel you, kick you out of here, <laughs> and you're evil. And uh, it's just, uh, it's ridiculous. And that I think that slowed down the progress. You know, it's it's funny because they use the word progressive. And we're going backwards, <laughs> not forwards in many things. Well, the whole uh, progress. What's what was that? that, Sam? The whole canceling people is definitely, yeah, yeah. not serving anybody. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, some people I wouldn't mind are canceled permanently, but, but <laughs> the thing is, is, uh, it's, um, it's not the, a logical way to move forward, but lo- again, logic and common sense are almost out the window. Well, that, that is actually a theme that I had to wrestle with for quite some time. The whole question of logic versus emotion and where does reason fit in and all that. Because for the longest time, I tried to govern my right, life through logic and reason. And I tried to do my business work through logic and reason. And I tried to um, do my personal life through logic and reason. And every single time I lost, I kept losing over and over and over and over. No, see, I don't believe that. Do not believe that. In fact, I was ready for this. Okay. So I looked up this uh, this uh, Laura lady that was uh, that blew us off. I might add. <laughs> 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 but so she had a thing where uh, she was saying about you should uh, forget about um, other people's opinions and just go with your your gut. Mm-hmm. That was it. Was a first bullet in this thing on her website. All right? Okay, sure. So this past weekend, I put a hot water in uh, ear in for this uh, lady that was a better mother to me than my own mother. And had I not asked an opinion of this buddy of mine who's an electrician, I would have blown up her house. <laughs> right? so, so there are times when it. It makes sense to not go with your intuition 
and go uh, ask uh, for advice for things. So, sure. you, again, to me, that was uh, if talk about blanketing things. She said, yeah, just always use your intuition. You know, don't worry about what other people say. Well, thank God she's not here to defend herself. So, well, I can defend her. I, I, can, I can actually defend it fairly easily. I mean, how can you f- defend that? If I wouldn't simple. have asked, I would have blown up a house. And you're going to defend that? Um, I'm not going to attempt to defend blowing up a house. What I am going to attempt to do is to, without having even read her comment, because I didn't read it. You read it. I didn't read that yeah. particular comment on the website. But I have a, a general idea. I know Laura well. Um, I, I, I know in general how she thinks about things. And I have a very high level of confidence that... Uh, I'm not sure how she phrased it on the website, but in her belief system, her belief system isn't that you should never take in, a, a evidence from outside and take that evidence into account. That's not what her belief system is. What that's belief, what the bullet point said. I well, mean, that's the way you're interpreting the bullet point. Again, I didn't read the bullet point, so I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to okay. comment directly on the bullet point. All I'm right. going to tell you what I know about Laura. What I know about her is... She certainly uses outside evidence. She certainly believes that it's a good idea to use outside evidence. But when there is a conflict between outside evidence and internal evidence, and there's reason to be suspicious of the outside evidence and reason to be concerned about the outside evidence, that's when it actually pays dividends to go inside and say, what does this really feel like to me? Totally. That makes sense. And I'm willing to bet, said. and I'm willing to bet that's what she was trying to convey on her website without uh, having, without having read it. it. Yeah, see, because you put three or four sentences to put it in context and said, yeah, okay, I totally agree with that. But the way she made her bullet point, no way. But Not isn't that the way bullet points are? That's what bullet point, the whole point no, of a bullet point is. They mislead or mess the point. How many times have you make? misled? You, in, in, <laughs> in my view, there have been numerous times during this conversation where you made a blanket statement. Now, was it always truly blanket? Well, as we did, as we kind of dug down, we found, well, no, there were exceptions and so forth. But the way you originally laid it out was a blanket statement. That's what bullet points are. They're blanket statements. Well, uh, so I, I think that when you look at a blanket statement, what you really need to do is look a little bit deeper and say, okay, so what's behind the bullet point? Because if all you're doing is going off of bullet points, I guarantee you, talk about being a victim. You're making yourself a victim at that point. Well, you are setting yourself are, up to be taken for, advantage of by anybody who lays out a bullet point. Bullet points are there for a reason. To concisely convey information to people that are not analyticals, that are skimmers. And so if a bullet point is not thought out well enough, it's going to send pers- a person down the wrong path of what you meant, which is exactly what you did. Well, there's also a second possibility that you're kind of skipping past. This, this, is, a, this is a good example of what we're talking about here. And that is there are a number of different ways to understand the the meaning behind words. People have different ideas about what words mean. There, there are sort of broad definitions we all kind of agree with, but there are also the gray areas. All right, and try those... Here's one for you to try. What's a woman? It's a very effective way. It's a very effective way to distract me from the point that I'm trying to make. Except, the, <laughs> except for there's one problem with it, and that is I refuse to be distracted. So I'm going to go back to the point Ooh. that I was trying to make. I forgot what it was. What was it? I know you. Well, you, you that's, that's part of the way the distraction works. Take take away attention from the, the point that was but being I'm made. But I'm going to come back to the and, I, and I'm pretty sure the reason you were distracting me away is you knew I was actually pointing to something that was actually valid, and and it would it would kind of step on the point you were making, and that's why you were distracting me away. Not really. No, <laughs> but it's good. It was a good premise. Good try. I'm pretty sure it's true. <laughs> so anyway. what was it? Hey, you're distracted away. Uh, clearly, see, clearly, clearly, you don't even want to go there. So I'm not going to push a point that you don't want to talk about. That's I still fine. would like to know if you could define a woman, because we were talking about <laughs> language, you know, and our Supreme Court justice can't do it. So. I, I'm not really concerned about trying to define a woman. That's your issue. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm pretty sure that I'm not one. <laughs> even well, though, good. Okay, even but. Though, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not one either, but I'm not the one who's concerned about trying to define it. You, that's my point. <laughs> no, that was on the news. I don't care what was on the news. I don't pay attention to the news. Well, you, you were you, bringing up the point about language yep. and meanings of words. Right? Okay. And so, uh, so that's where that immediately, you know, cause remember I was a, a professional comedian for, mm-hmm. for six straight years. And, uh, and so I s- see things differently than the, the average person, I would say, because I, I see, uh, the media, the minute you said words, I went to the TV show where the the lady, the new Supreme Court justice, couldn't define the word woman, so I couldn't help it. 
well, okay, that's fine. That shows yeah. what your worldview is. Your worldview is about what's going on in the news with the woman who was appointed to the Supreme Court. I actually don't get all caught up in the but whole it, question. But as it related, it bother me. But it related to so, what you were talking about. Or I but but, but you, want, you wanted to pin me down on a definition that I didn't care about, so I hadn't given any thought or attention to <laughs> No, but you were talking about, uh, the reason I even brought it up was because you were talking about the meaning of words. Right. And the reason I was talking about the meaning of words is if you if you were to take any given word and you, you could even go with woman, that's fine. You could talk to ten different people and you could get ten different definitions. Not but that at you least always you get, get a not, definition. <laughs> you couldn't get any of them. Well, you, I know you want to tear down somebody who is a Supreme Court nominee. That's <laughs> that's your privilege. But if we're talking about the the concept of words, different people will think of different words differently. And and they're going to think about it not only in terms of their conversations with others, but in terms of their own internal conversations, which you know very well. People people routinely, <laughs> what's the best way to say it? They trap themselves with their own words. They trap themselves with their own thoughts. You, you, what was the example you were giving before? You were talking about, uh, what was the context? It was kids in school. Oh, geez, I can't remember what it was now. Sorry, that's a, that's a digression. I can't I can't pull it in. But my point is, people regularly and routinely have different ways of looking at the same word, the same concept, the same idea, which is, by the way, part of what makes life interesting, because we have all these different perspectives going on in life. So the question becomes this. If you use a word one way and I use a word a different way, is your word right and my word wrong? Is your oh, definition absolutely. right and my word wrong? <laughs> Mine's right. <laughs> and, and the moment that, we, that yeah. we adopt that viewpoint is the moment that we stop looking at other perspectives. <laughs> Because you said it yourself, it's absolute. Yeah, and I was just kidding, of course. Yeah, and I was uh, making a point off of your kidding. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sam is a great co-host, I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fascinating watching your two opposing perspectives come come alive in this conversation. Well, what's what is is that I uh, love about it is the fact nobody's getting mad, nobody's calling names and being jerks about it, which is like what I see as the, the, the way the world has turned. Uh, you know. How dare you disagree with me? Yeah, <laughs> it's not, they don't even say that. They're just canceled or, you know, you're called a racist or whatever they want to call you to, to cancel you. You know, so, so um, yeah, we need more of this kind of stuff. You yeah, know, that, I think it's it opens healthy. opens up um, people's minds, but people's minds have been, getting closed more closed and closed and closed where mine is not i mean i'm open to anything i have a you know a a, a, a boisterous opinion about things but i listen mm -hmm. you know and it's not that i just cut out and say wait for my turn to talk that's that's the i uh, wish people would uh, would do more of that <laughs> i hear you on that one <laughs> no doubt about that well this has been very fascinating and unfortunately our hour is drawing to a close um there are undoubtedly people who have been listening in who want to learn more about you about Tom <laughs> and you really and, think <laughs> oh i have no doubt about it, it happens all the time <laughs> so give people an idea first of all how do they find you and uh, how do they reach out to you well my podcast is called screw the commute which uh, both of you are invited on by the way thank you um and it's based on the fact I never had a job, but it's very entrepreneurial, and uh, we don't get into these kind of deep things. Where most of us entrepreneurs are very shallow. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Another broad brush. <laughs> so, so you know, at least I am. All right, I'll just put make a first <laughs> You're shallow. Very, tough, okay. very shallow. So, <laughs> so well, if you we, insist, <laughs> we're more we're we're uh, mostly about how to do things. If you want this result in business, this is what you do, and. Uh, and a lot of uh, interesting stories of other very successful entrepreneurs. So uh, they can uh, go to, uh, if they want to email me, they can go to Tom at screwthecommute.com. And if they, um, if they want to see the, um, the trailer to the documentary, it's at facebook.com slash American Entrepreneur Film. I wish we'd had more time to talk about that, actually. We got off of that other interesting, <laughs> very interesting tangent, but I, I would like to have heard more about that. That, that sounds very cool. Well, I'm not, and I'm not dead yet. There you go. <laughs> They're still doing a documentary. <laughs> and anyone who wants to know what he's talking about, play back at the beginning of the episode. You'll there know you exactly go. what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, Tom, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us on the show today. My Thank you pleasure. For your time. And uh, Sam is usual. Sam's always a, a very quiet, except when we have him playing piano. We didn't. Yeah, I wanted to today. hear some piano, but I'm um, at well, the next time. Yeah. You, do you have your piano handy? It's right behind me. <laughs> give, give, give us 30 seconds or something. Oh, sure. Let's see. All right. 
Don't, don't, don't do the Reiki version either. <laughs> 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 Here's my here's my response to that. See, oh excuse me. See this going like this? That's the golden buzzer on America's Got Talent. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Well, happy to do it. And I just learned that over a weekend course. For no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so cool about Sam, though. He can just whip them out. Just okay, let's just yeah. play something here. Whoop, here we go. All right. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Watch some of those YouTube guys at the airports. <laughs> I'll have to, yeah, I'll have yeah. to study them and become them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, th- once again, thank you very much, Tom, for joining us. Thank you, Sam, as usual. And uh, we're sorry that Lori can make it uh, this week. And fortunately, I mean, she's going to be off doing her contract for the next six months. But we'll welcome her back when she's able to return. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.